Be the Talk, episode 350, featuring Stephen Adler. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Stephen Adler. Stephen, are you ready to talk? I am ready to talk. Good morning. Stephen Adler invented internet insurance, enterprise data privacy, data governance, and people data. He's worked in 60 countries over 25 years. He has four patents and two U.S. President Volunteer Service Awards. Stephen is mission-motivated to use data to save the oceans. Stephen Adler, welcome to the talk. No, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Your talk is called the Ocean Data Challenge, and uh, man, what a what a powerful talk! You were over in Africa uh, doing an open data conference, and right smack dab in the middle of the conference, disaster! Ebola is breaking out, and twenty people in the room get texted at the exact same time that their flights are canceled. And I would imagine they might be actually, by implication, basically blocked out of their country. And you sprung into action. Please take us behind the talk. Oh, well, it was actually in Washington, D.C. It was um, in August of um, 2015. Um, uh, President Obama had a U.S.-Africa leadership summit in Washington. And... Um, uh, I was uh, representing IBM um, in the Open Government Partnership, which was an Obama administration initiative to uh, spread ideas of open government and open data around the world. Seventy countries participate in it. And I was really keen on um, attending this U.S.-Africa Leadership Summit, so I asked uh, some folks at the State Department if anybody was covering open data. And they said no. I said, well, uh, we'd like to. We have an office. I was at IBM, and we have an office on uh, uh, 16th and G Street, two blocks from the White House. We, we'd be happy to host an event, uh, maybe a side event. And so um, lots of conversations, and we hastily put together an event together with um, the White House, the State Department, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, we invited a bunch of folks from different African countries to participate. We had about 20 from Sierra Leone and Liberia, some folks from Nigeria, from Kenya, South Africa. And uh, we had a great event, and at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon during this event, um, all of a sudden, everyone started getting their phones vibrating at the same time. You know, it was like a, like a fire alarm or something went off, and the, everybody just looked at their phones, and they looked at me, they looked at each other, and they were just aghast, because this is August 5th, 2015, and um, I think uh, they were notified by British Airways that their flights back to Freetown and Monrovia were canceled due to the Ebola outbreak. At the time there were only 80 known cases of Ebola in both countries. So both countries have 5 million people. This is like saying there are 80 cases of tuberculosis in New Jersey, so therefore we're going to you know, quarantine the entire state. Well, it and, was big. It was big news at the time. And uh, Talk Universe, you know that I come from a medical family, so infectious <laughs> diseases like that, big news in my household. So uh, we were very closely monitoring the situation and – uh, I'm so happy that they were able to eventually get uh, around it. But I'm I'm even more happy that you were able to spring into action, use uh, use some of the uh, almost I, I don't know what to call it crowdsourcing or, or or open data principles to get them all uh, a plan to be able to stay in the um, you know with a roof over their head until they could be cleared for reentry, Stephen. Yeah, it was a really interesting experience. We, I don't I wouldn't say that I did it alone. I had a lot of really terrific people who participated. Um, both inside of IBM and in the New York Open Data Community, Beta NYC. A bunch of people participated. Um, Gene Holm was now the CTO for Los Angeles and uh, um, Rich Robbins. And I had a whole group of people who participated. What we did really was we did it, we built an inventory of healthcare capacity in uh, Sierra Leone. What mm. we identified from the start was, was we just didn't know where all the hospitals were. You know, it sounds kind of funny because – in the United States, we take it for granted that we have an address system. If you want to go to um, IBM's headquarters in New York, it's 590 Madison Avenue. You know the exact address. There are a lot of countries in the world that don't have any addresses. I've been to no some of them. It, it is a crazy experience when you're walking around and then you think of that uh, U2 song, Where the Streets Have No Name. 
Yes. And that's it exactly. You're in the middle of a city of a million people or half a million people and block to block to block. It is very disorienting and, and, and yeah. kind of frustrating. Yeah, you, you ask people, where's the hospital? And they say, well, it's the White House down the block, three, three <laughs> blocks this way, three blocks that way. And, you know, every house is white. Uh, and so we were asking, where, where are all the hospitals? Where are the, where are the health care status? And nobody could tell us. Um, we had we saw lists from uh, International Red Cross that was like six years old. World Bank had a list that was four or five years old. We asked the government for a list. They didn't have a list. They just gave us lists that they'd been given from other people. So we thought, well, let's just maybe we can add some value if we analyze all the lists and see where the discrepancies are and see if we can't come up with a comprehensive list of healthcare capacity in the country. We didn't want to just know where the hospitals are, but. What are, the, what are the GPS locations? Do they have a helipad? Are they connected to rows? Do they have potable water? You know, some basic things about capacity. And as we did that work, we realized um, not only did, was there no capacity mapping in Sierra Leone, you know, there's no capacity mapping in the United States either. We know where all the hospitals are. We just don't know what they are. Hmm. We don't know, you know, what their capacities are. We don't know which beds are free. And it was really a fascinating experience to, to study you know, there's so many things we take for granted in modern life mm -hmm. without fully realizing because we live so hot, sort of hyper local. We don't really think about um, what are the capacities of the public services that surround us and where are the best places to go. And sort of sort of un unleashed a whole series of questions that we had about the role of data in describing the modern world we live in. And it turns out that a lot of aspects of our world are not described very well. There isn't adequate data. I love that uh, we went from a Ebola crisis and, and finding GPS coordinates in lieu of an address to looking back at the United States and saying, hey, we don't know what this hospital is known for or specializes in or what the capacity is or whatever. Uh, so what a, what a great way to bring it back home and yeah, you know, increase you, you our efficiency. You can go efficiency. to Travelocity or to um, um, any of the websites, Expedia, and you can find out which hotels have rooms how many rooms they have, what the costs of the rooms are. Uh, you can find out exhaustive information about hotel capacity in almost any city across the country, but you can't find out the same information about hospitals and how many beds they have and what they're good for. Stephen, I, if it's okay with you, I'd love to uh, take a little trip in the time machine because you've done so many kind of epic things with online and data and all of that. I really kind of want to know what you were doing about 30 years ago when this whole thing was about to uh, to break open. I remember being in high school and watching uh, the, the news programs that they had piped in, which sold basically uh, soft drinks and other horrible <laughs> things in the commercials. But there was an AT&T commercial, and it basically said, imagine ordering pizza from mm. your house. Imagine... Mm. You know, ordering, uh, taking a trip around the world and getting plane tickets from your living room. Mm -hmm. It's coming, and the company that will bring it to you is AT&T. I want to know what you were doing 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, when all of this stuff was happening to be able to have invented Internet insurance uh, and then enterprise data privacy and all of these things when, when all of these things were not even in the mass consciousness. Can you take us back there? I don't know if I can go back 35 years because I think I was probably just uh, twiddling my thumbs in a college class 35 years ago. Well, obviously you saw you saw where this was headed, and you were probably hanging out with other people that were trendsetters, and so you were able to uh, to really be a formative person in in the earlier days in the internet, just from looking well, at that. Bio. I, was, I was. I think a lot of people had the same thoughts I did. I was pretty lucky. I was. Um, uh, I started working for IBM in IBM Denmark in uh, 1995. And uh, one of the first, uh, I think the first day of my job, they had me on a plane to Brussels where IBM had a training center. And I was supposed to go down there and learn about something they call the insurance application architecture, which was a kind of a data model for insurance. And I spent six weeks living in Brussels learning about it. But on the flight down, my first day of work, um, I got a Financial Times and I was reading it on the plane, and it was um, September 95, and this was about the time where Lloyd's of London was going bankrupt for some catastrophic losses that they had suffered from hurricanes. Mm. And there was an obituary, and a, a full four-page obituary, basically, of the, of the of Lloyd's of London. And they described how Lloyd's was originally designed in the 1670s to underwrite shipping. Mm. 
Now, I thought about that, and I thought it's really fascinating. 1670s, at that time, large numbers of people around the world thought the world was flat, and that if you sailed over the edge of the ocean, you would fall off the edge of the earth or you get eaten by sea monsters. Yet somehow, some people with math skills figured out that if you built a ship right, if you had a good crew, and if you sailed at a certain time of year, there was a probability that the ship would bring its cargo to the next port, load up, and return. And that probability could be calculated. And you could design a financial product to ensure that product, to ensure the losses that might occur if something did go wrong. And I thought about that, and I thought about the Internet at that moment, 1995, 96. A lot of people probably don't remember. We were having a big debate then about whether or not the Internet would be commercialized, because at that point it was largely an academic environment. And there was a whole bunch of talk about how business was going to ruin it. And I began thinking, well, we're probably at the same moment. Mm -hmm. We're probably standing at the moment in which we're now looking out over the edge of the earth and we're seeing that in the next five or 10 years, the internet will be commercialized and we will start doing business online. And we'll be doing, you know, at that point we were communicating with 9,600 baud modems. And I said, well, at some point we're gonna be actually communicating much faster and we're gonna be shipping CDs around the world to each other and selling music online. And if you're gonna be selling music online, that's like selling music at a store on the corner. And you don't sell music on a store at the corner unless you have insurance to underwrite your property and casualty uh, liabilities or directors and officers insurance in case you get sued. And the same kinds of exposures are going to appear online. And we should anticipate that. We should help the insurance industry understand this new business area and provide coverage for it. And I, I presented that internally at IBM. And uh, in the beginning, everyone just said, you, what? Do you, what? Mm-hmm. No, we're not there yet. You know, just wait. <laughs> It'll happen, but just, you know, go back to Brussels and learn about the insurance application architecture. I said, well, that's fine, but I really think that this is an opportunity for us to transform the dialogue with insurance companies to stop telling them that they should sell um, auto insurance online. You know, there was like four people in Belgium who were on the Internet in 1995, so they weren't going to make any money selling auto insurance online, but they could start understanding how the Internet was going to change business. And that proved to be, I think, the, the magic uh, but I, I ended up becoming like a global evangelist for this. And I was speaking at conferences around the world. We persuaded foreign insurance companies to come with us and learn about the Internet and to change their business practices. So how did you kind of break through the glass ceiling a little bit? Because IBM is famous for uh, for missing another really big opportunity about 30 years ago. Uh, so I'm glad they finally listened to you uh, as as a visionary who could who could see the need for this? Uh, did you just have uh, persistence and a little bit of political savvy to be able to keep the idea alive, even as you you followed kind of the directions that you were given? Yeah, I, I don't give up. You know, I, I yeah. just, I'm just I'm just not somebody who gives up. Um, the more people will tell me that I'm wrong, the more often I think I'm right. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's a liability in a lot of ways. Um, but in this case, it, you know, IBM is actually an incredibly um company in terms of intellectual ideas. Um, there's just a huge, uh, you can see that in the number of patents. I think this year the company had 9,000 patents. Mm. Uh, last year was 8,000. The next year maybe it'll be 10,000 finally. But internally there's so many ideas. There's so many things that we, um, the people think of in IBM decades before it becomes reality in the marketplace. Now, that being the case, it's also oftentimes difficult to get your idea out of the cacophony of other good ideas. So you have to be patient. You have to be persistent. And I often think that IBM is just like a, it's just like a long corridor with a bunch of doors. You just have to go down and knock on the doors. And pe- most of the time, people aren't going to answer the door. You just go keep knocking until you find a door that answers, and you just keep going. And that's the, my approach to almost all uh, ideas. I think if you have a good idea, you have to keep pushing for it. Um, nobody's going to come and just you know, roll out the red carpet. There's no um, process by which a new, a good idea gets automatically recognized and funded. You have to make it happen yourself. Well, we've been enjoying this conversation with Stephen Adler. His talk is called The Ocean Data Challenge. And we're going to be right back in just a moment, pivoting over to you, Talk Universe, for the Blitz Round. Hey, Talk Universe. I hope you've been enjoying today's episode with today's guest. But you know what? Many people want more than that. Many people that listen to Be The Talk actually want to give a talk. And if that's you, you're not alone. Listen to the rest of this podcast. At the end, 
I'll have a free resource for you just for listening. And we're back with Stephen Adler. It is time for the Blitz Round. I'm going to ask Stephen a series of either-or questions related to the preparation and performance of his recent talk. Stephen, are you ready? I'm ready. Were you invited to speak or did you apply? I was invited to speak. Would you consider yourself a memorizer, an improviser, or a blender? I'm an improviser. How did that serve you in the talk? Uh, I think it served pretty well. You mean the TED Talk? Yeah. Uh, oh, the TED Talk was really... Um, you can't improvise too much in a TED Talk because um, they, they, they give you a script. Um, I did my TED Talk in Lima, Peru. Mm -hmm. And um, I had almost no time to prepare prior to arriving because wow. I didn't really know what was involved. A friend of mine gave me a book on how to prepare for a TED Talk. I read the book. <laughs> oh, and then I showed up. <laughs> no, the book is how to prepare for a TED talk, but yeah. I gave a TEDx talk and a TEDx talk is a specific talk in a specific community. Mm -hmm. And I gave a TEDx talk in a Spanish speaking country mm -hmm. and I was the only uh, English speaker on the stage. So I had to work with um, Peruvians to prepare for my talk. And I had about a week before my TED talk to memorize my script. And they told me before the talk, you know, you, know, you have to stand on a red dot. Mm -hmm. So, one, I don't like to stand still. I like to walk around. Two, I don't like to just talk. I like to engage my audience. So I really didn't like the TED Talk because you have to stand and you can't see the audience. The lights are crimping your you style, Stephen. And then they told me that uh, there was going to be a teleprompter. And there wasn't. <laughs> They said that was a, they. They oh. just told me that to make me feel better, but but so there wasn't. So, so I they, to they took the, the oh, there'll be a security blanket, and then they yanked it right, right away. away. So, um, <laughs> Pushed you out on stage. <laughs> um, but you know, it's a good experience yeah. uh, overall. Um, you only get eighteen minutes to talk. It's a kind of a staged, uh, kind of a, a scripted format that you have to go through. Um, I think the best benefit was it helped me really think concretely about what I had accomplished or what we had accomplished and, and how to relate it to the public. Well, we've been enjoying this blitz round with Stephen Adler. His talk is called the ocean data challenge. And uh, if you want to check that talk out and you don't want to type it into YouTube, you can go to our show notes page instead at be the talk.com and watch it there. We will have a link to that. And uh, we will also have a link to Stephen's website, OceanDataAlliance.com, OceanDataAlliance.com. And we're going to be right back with Stephen Adler's final word of advice for you, Talk Universe. Hey, Talk Universe, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you want to give the talk to change the world, but you don't know how or even where to start, no problem at all. Go to be the talk dot com forward slash get accepted for my new five day email course that'll show you how absolutely free. Just go to be the talk dot com forward slash get accepted. And we're back. It is time for the final word of advice from Stephen Adler. What is it? Oh, your advice. Never give up. Always keep going. Always push your ideas. You mean advice for the TED Talk or advice in general? That's great advice. We'll take it. Okay. Stephen Adler, thank you so much for coming on the talk today and sharing your wisdom with Talk Universe. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to be the talk.com. See you tomorrow.